Today's webinar is going to be talking about a range of pasture weeds. And the outline for today's webinar will basically cover both the effects of the 2012 drought as well as this weed response because they're uh, connected very much. So, and then I'll also talk a little bit about some of the recommendations and follow follow up and suggestions for next year, 2014. Now, it's quite a difference a year makes. Uh, this picture here on the left uh, shows a Sand Hill Valley in August of 2012, and on the right is uh, the same valley in August of 2013, and very noticeable is the uh, abundance of, of sunflowers that uh, occurred in many areas of the Sand Hills. Well, in 2012, of course, the drought, and this graph here shows the uh, monthly precipitation for the growing season, uh, April through, uh, through September. And you can see, other than uh, fairly, being fairly close to average in April, the rest of 2012 was extremely dry. In fact, only four and a half inches about uh, during that uh, summer uh, growing season in 2012. In 2013, most areas across Nebraska did fairly well. Granted, there are some areas that are still relatively dry. But this location, the Goodness and Sandhills lab, had about 14 and a half inches, and this being through the month of August. Don't have the September data in yet. So uh, many areas, of course, throughout the state of the pastures and, and rangelands had a variety of different weeds present in them this year. Uh, I use the term also poor sometimes, which is uh, in in is synonymous with with weeds to a lot of people. But uh, primarily what we were dealing with was mostly annual weeds. Now in this image here we can see a whole host of annual weeds from lamb's quarters, sunflowers, pepper weeds, and so on. And then there were a couple of uh, perennial weeds, in this case the uh, western ragweed and cutweed sagewort, that uh, did quite well and were quite abundant this past summer also. Well, one of the ways I like to think about the, the drought we had is that it is like a disturbance to our pastures and rangeland. It's a, an event that, that impacts these plant communities quite dramatically. And in fact, it's, it's uh, very similar in a sense to uh, other types of disturbances such as a wildfire or severe hail, um, severe growing season freeze, or even uh, some disking of a pasture or rangeland. Now there were many, many perennial species, or native perennial species that also seemed to do quite well this year. I mentioned the uh, ragweed and uh, cutweed sage but Here's just a photo of uh, some uh, verbena that uh, quite uh, prominent with its uh, purple yellow flowers back in uh, June and July. Also some of our more colorful wildflowers uh, like the Shelly Tensmum did quite well. In different parts of the state, uh, the annual weeds that seem to really flourish varied somewhat here in, uh, on the Sandy site in Sioux County. We have uh, Russian thistle seems to be uh, the most dominant species, weedy species out there this year. In uh, Keith County on some uh, heavier soil, uh, downy brome was, was very abundant. And normally downy brome or cheatgrass likes to have some moisture precipitation in the fall of the year to get that winter annual seed started and then that plant overwinters and then really takes off following spring. But here we were dry in, in the fall of 2012 as well, but enough rainfall fell in moisture this past spring that uh, the downy brome still managed to flourish and grow quite well. I mentioned earlier the sunflowers in, Tom, or in the Sandhills area very abundant and uh, quite quite a striking sight to see. Some locations didn't have too much in the way of uh, uh, specific weed problems in their pastures. Certainly um, not to the extent that a lot of areas were observing. There were some interesting fence line contrasts apparent too. Uh, in this case here, um, got a on the right side of the fence line of pastures that was grazed in June, and then on the left side, uh, a pasture that the cattle were just turned into. Now, 
one of the, the reasons behind this is that many of these weedy species do have some uh, forage value and, and were grazed. So in the case of this June pasture, at that time the uh, sunflowers were much younger and much more palatable than they were now. We also noticed that some of the other weedy species like uh, lamb's quarter, that uh, the livestock were, were uh, grazing and, and uh, consuming those quite readily. Here's another uh, interesting photo here. Uh, this here fence line right here, to the left being a uh, section line easement, and it's uh, never grazed or very rarely grazed. And then on the right was a pasture that uh, received really heavy grazing in, in 2012, but had not yet been grazed in 2013. And uh, as we go out further into that pasture here, we can see that uh, there's plenty of uh, weedy species out there, but, but not much in the way of sunflowers. And upon uh, looking a little closer, one of the things that's pretty evident that the condition of the grasses that were in that pasture were, were really poor, quite thin, a lot of bare ground because of the previous heavy grazing. And what that, uh, I guess, uh, is, is uh, connected to is that in the case of the areas with sunflowers, one of the requirements of sunflowers to have is a certain amount of residue or litter on the ground for them to be able to uh, uh, germinate and, and, and grow. In this case here, the heavily grazed pasture, the litter and uh, residue just wasn't there. All in all, when it comes to some of these weedy species, uh, my message has been really not to worry too much about them, particularly this, this past year. Uh, they do have some good and in terms of the forage value. And very importantly, what that was doing early on this summer when those weeds were being grazed, it was reducing grazing pressure on our desirable grasses as they were recovering from the drought. Also very important, our pastures, because of the way most were grazed in 2012, they did not have much in the way of residue or litter left. And what these weeds will do this fall is become that residue and litter. On the bad side of things, uh, as far as the weeds, they do use some soil moisture and some, provide some shading to, to uh, other plants in there, but uh, for the most part, uh, I feel that it's uh, better to have some of those weeds present than nothing at all. And for a lot of people, they just didn't like the way their pastures looked because of all these weeds. I mentioned litter, and, and just like uh, uh, litter is regarded as being very important in our cropping system, in our pastures and rangelands too, it does have a benefit. Without litter, we're likely to have increased soil temperatures, greater evaporation, reduced water infiltration, and uh, greater erosion potential. And here, just an example of uh, excellent or lit residue or litter. Now, overall, some of the impacts of the 2012 drought on our grasses, which, of course, are related to this explosion of weeds we had this past year, I think overall that the cool season grasses probably took it a little bit harder than the warm seasons. And we have to consider, though, of course, with those cool season grasses, we had the droughts both spring and fall of last year, but also this past April, we had some really cold temperatures down into the lower and mid-teens, which uh, did impact and slow those cool seasons down considerably because they had already started some of their initial growth. As far as some of the warm seasons, uh, I noticed, and this is with a number of people like uh, indicating the little blue stem, it did uh, suffer quite a bit from the 2012 drought. We saw some plants that uh, had uh, complete death of the of the individual tillers within a bunch or in some cases just parcel death loss. As far as some of the warm season tall grasses like uh, the uh, switchgrass, uh, big blue stem, sand blue stem, uh, prairie sand reed, uh, most of them had a bit of a variable response, kind of depended on, on the local severity of, of, uh, of the drought. One thing that a lot of people commented on uh, earlier this spring was uh, uh, Kentucky bluegrass, which is a cool season grass, 
that uh, prior to 2012, it had been increasing in a lot of our pastures just because of the wet conditions we had back in 2011, 10, and 09. And uh, last year, of course, uh, it, it really set that bluegrass back just flat out and killed it. And you can see that dead mat of bluegrass on the ground surface. And then a number of weed species coming up uh, in that area. As far as some of the other important species of smooth road grass, uh, we did see some death loss on it in uh, some of the areas here in uh, uh, Banner County, far western Nebraska, where just patches had, had just completely died. But as far as the smooth road, it appears that there was just a threshold for it to uh, really either die, like uh, shown here in this image, or, or thrive quite well. Because in other parts of uh, Nebraska, particularly eastern and more central Nebraska, uh, the smooth bone grass recovered quite nicely. Another native species that uh, has a great drought resilience is the western wheatgrass. Likewise, uh, its cousins, the intermediate wheatgrass, seem to respond really well this year after the drought. So that was encouraging to see with those two species. Uh, in our native uh, rangeland and pastures, we're dealing with a, quite a mixture of these broadleaf broadly forms or broadleaf plants, some of which are weedy in nature, but uh, many are, are not. And so when it comes to just wide-scale broadcast use of herbicides on our, on our native rangelands, I'm a little hesitant about that because of the fact that we'll be damaging a lot of the native forbs that in, in most cases, I have uh, you know, fairly good forage value. Uh, some of them are legumes. And so a better approach, I think, is that uh, we work on our grazing management to maintain a high level of range condition or a high ecological status. And that will go a long way in, in keeping down or keeping at bay many of these undesirable weedy species. I'm anticipating next year in 2014, as, uh, as long as we maintain more near average uh, rainfall patterns, I think we'll see a lot uh, fewer of those annual weeds next year. And, and tied with that is I think uh, this year much, much of our native range and pastures has, uh, has begun its recovery from the drought quite nicely. The exception, of course, is if we're dealing with some uh, noxious or problem perennial weeds, uh, then, then uh, spot or, or patch spraying, some of those may be necessary in, in all types of pasture. So a variety of uh, weedy species that we could be dealing with uh, certainly uh, is considerable. Um, the horse weed or mare's tail, quite abundant this year. And again, I mentioned earlier the, uh, the western ragweed uh, uh, perennial. Uh, native species. Some of the other natives, uh, uh, the ironweed seems to, have done, seems to have done fairly well this year. It is a perennial, likewise with the cudweed sagewood. Um, some of the annuals, uh, introduced annual species, there was a, a lot of uh, lambs quarters this year. Uh, most of those, all of them, all of them, I should say, are, are annual species. And then, of course, uh, I heard some reports from individuals talking about uh, the thistles, whether it be the musk or Canada thistle, that seem to uh, require, recover quite nicely for the drought, too. And, of course, when we deal with any of these noxious species, some, some type of uh, control is, is uh, recommended. For the seeded or introduced grass pastures, such as a smooth brome or uh, intermediate wheat grass or, or any type of seeded pasture that you might have. Certainly weed control using some herbicides can really enhance or increase the rate of recovery. Uh, people might also use this opportunity to uh, do some improvement of that seed pasture and by that I mean some grass or legume interseeding to uh, benefit it even more for future years. Some of the key things uh, when we're dealing with weeds, it is important to know what the species of weed you're dealing with, and along with that, the characteristics such as whether it's an annual or a perennial, uh, whether it's a cool 
or has a warm season, a period of growth. And the reason these are important is because it, uh, it does relate to the application of, or, or the timing of the herbicide application. In, in most cases, um, the late May to early mid or even late June time period is uh, uh, quite effective in terms of the herbicides can be quite effective at that time of year when we're spraying weeds that are, are relatively young in terms of their, their growth stage and not to the point of being flowering or, or fully headed out. For some perennial weeds, October is also another good time of the year that uh, um, some uh, herbicides can be quite effective. At that time of year, things like the thistles are in a smaller rosette stage, and then these perennials or biennials are sending down um, nutrients and building up energy, energy reserves in the fall of the year. And so when herbicides applied at that time, those are transportated into the root system quite nicely and uh, have an effective root kill as well. There's a number of different uh, range and pasture herbicides out there. Again, I mentioned uh, uh, knowing the species of weeds you're, you're dealing with. And, and again, if we're uh, thinking about this on some of our native rangelands or plant communities, certainly have to be aware that there's going to be other uh, desirable broadleaf plants that are going to be affected as well. And again, cannot overemphasize the importance of the correct timing and in, in terms of the herbicide application to be most effective. Uh, the UNL Extension does put out each year uh, what's called their Guide for Weed Management. And in this uh, publication, there is a section on, on range and pasture weeds, as well as uh, suggested herbicides for each of those weeds. So it's just an excellent resource for uh, people looking to, to control some of the, the problem weeds that they might be having. And so with that, I will conclude today's webinar, and thank you for listening.